Welcome to The Rational Egoist. I'm Michael Leibowitz, and here with me is the one, the only, the magnificent Mr. James Stevens Valiant. Hey, Jim, you know, as I was doing the intro there, I thought about Apollo Creed and Rocky. You know, he's the master of disaster, the king of sting, the Count of Monte Fisto. You know, that's you. <laughs> oh, wow. I am rather magnificent, aren't I? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I'm astonished at my own magnificence almost on a daily basis. <laughs> so, Jim, with the... Uh, election for president we just had there's a lot of posts i see facebook on x where i've seen both sides of it actually if you're an objectivist you could never vote for trump and i've seen if you're an objectivist you must vote for trump or you're not understanding objectivism uh, i i've seen other people you know i got into a debate with a, a guy and he says that you don't have to accept uh, Rand's critique of anarcho-capitalism. You can be an anarcho-capitalist and be an objectivist. And I got to thinking, well, I don't really know then what, what an objectivist is. Um, <laughs> a, as you, you know, when you first met me, I didn't call myself an objectivist. I'd said, I'm a disciple of Ayn Rand, but I don't care to argue objectivist, not objectivist. You know, there's a, sm slight areas of disagreement I have with her and I'm not into to arguing about it. But you were one of the people that convinced me, no, no, you're an objectivist. So I said, okay, I'll take the title. I'm not trying to deny anything. You know what I mean? <laughs> but well, let's discuss it. We're going to get into what is an objectivist. But first, what is objectivism? Because just let me just say, the other day I saw one guy talk about the objectivist movement and another guy said objectivism is a philosophy, not a movement. And my thing, I said, well, I'm saying to myself, it's both. It's both a philosophy and a philosophical movement. But we'll turn it back over to you. What is objectivism? Objectivism is a philosophy. It's also a movement. <laughs> hey, you teed me up really well there. No, it's a worldview. It's a worldview, like other worldviews. But the great philosophers of the past, the great religions of the past, for that matter, are particular worldviews. And they have a specific view of reality. And key here is human mankind's relationship to reality, the human relationship to reality. Uh, if I could define philosophy first, because that really helps us with objectivism. Uh, let's go nuts. Let's go nuts. Go crazy. <laughs> in for a penny, in for a pound. <laughs> we uh, look, uh, a philosophy is philosophy as such is the study. And this is unique to objectivism. Almost we would put it this way is the analysis of the relationship between human consciousness and existence between reality and man's mind put most broadly. Now, it's not obvious what all the implications of that are, but the implications of that are rather comprehensive. But they're the broadest things you can say about humanity and its relationship to reality. Let's call philosophy that. And so it's a specific worldview. And this view of the relationship between human consciousness and existence will inform us, not only tell us how people know, you know, the basic nature of reality, is it knowable? How we can know that reality. And it will give us guidance, value guidance, normative guidance on how to think. Because given a description of how to properly know, I can now give you tips. I can now give you advice, follow logic, go by the evidence, etc. Or in the, the realm of values, when I understand the relationship between consciousness and human consciousness and existence, I can then tell you, well, you better be rational. You better be adhering to reality. And, and being rational normatively implies all sorts of other things, being honest, productive, having integrity to your principles, et cetera. It even implies things about politics, respecting other people's rights. And so it is a complete worldview that kind of tells us the basic nature of existence, mankind's uh, uh, how mankind knows can come to know that existence, if and to the extent he does. And finally, what he should do about it, how he should live, what his basic value orientation should be. And finally, that has implications in things like politics, art, all kinds of other things as well. But those are the four basic branches of philosophy that Ayn Rand recognized. Most great philosophies in history have been comprehensive worldviews similar to that. They Hold might... on one second, Jim. Didn't she recognize five branches? Five branches of philosophy? The yes. Being... Art. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. That's why I tossed in art there. Exactly. The, the four primary ones. But art is unique to philosophy because it is uh, part of the understanding of our, the relationship between human consciousness and existence. Right. That universal. 
And so that's the key to philosophy. It's the most universal things you can say about to any human being about his or her relationship to existence as such. Um, there are differences between human beings. In other words, you, Michael, are going to have different values in, in many ways than I have values, but the values that objectively we should share or the normative guidance we should have when we come to know are basically the same. There's a huge overlap there. And that universal context that applies to everybody, we call philosophy. Religion, if you will, is a sort of primitive form of philosophy. Humans can't evade the need for philosophy. We need basic norm normative guidance. How do I figure stuff out? What is knowledge? What, what values should I pursue? These are not optional questions. Uh, I have a choice, and therefore I have to have a standard by which I make those choices. I have to know what I'm doing, how to make those choices, what I'm after, those big questions. And those are the big questions philosophy answers. Right. So now you mentioned the, the branches of philosophy and objectivism. So uh, Ayn Rand, but the, her five branches are metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, politics, and art, right? Aesthetics, yeah. Now she, uh, aesthetics, yeah. So she once said that, well, somebody asked her, can she explain her philosophy while standing on one foot? What was her answer? She did. Her, her philosophy while standing it was, on one was the foot. I think it was the publishers of Atlas Shrugged at Random House. People like Bennett Surf asked her if she could, or maybe it was one of the other editors at Random House, asked her if she could stand, uh, explain her philosophy while standing on one foot, foot when she was selling Atlas Shrugged to them. And she her description is hilarious. I did. So you can just imagine Ayn Rand standing on one foot as she's explaining this. Metaphysics, objective reality. Uh, she's a metaphysical realist. There is a reality independent of human consciousness. And it's up to human consciousness to know that reality. Uh, but existence comes first, and our minds must conform to that existence. She's a realist. But she just simply said, metaphysics, objective reality. Epistemology, reason. What is our means of knowing? Observation and logic. She defined reason as the uh, method of integrating and identifying the material provided by man's senses, and therefore the conceptual abstract identification through logic of uh, ob observation. That's how we know. Anything else, you see, she rejects both mysticism and universal skepticism. We are capable of knowing, but only if we adhere to an objective method. Uh, but uh, because we need an objective method, any old method won't do, like Ouija boards and mystic revelations. So uh, both, um, in her mind, they both, they both oppose the idea that a consciousness has a specific identity, in effect. In any case, she then proceeds to give us normative guidance based on uh, that, uh, that in epistemology, this is how you know. And then ba based on that, <laughs> she can proceed to questions of basic value questions. What are values? What role do they play in our lives? What standard of value should we deploy in understanding our values? How should we organize our values? What comprise the basic means of acquire, of obtaining our values? That is, what are the basic virtues? And uh, then she, of course, in a social context, that has a very specific application the human consciousness is such, she argues, that people have to be free from coercion from other human beings, that the operation of our basic means of knowledge itself requires a certain social condition to be operative, namely freedom. Um, and in order to do that, we have to recognize other people's rights. And so for her, politics is essentially a moral question, an application of the moral question of how should we treat other people. And fine. And Politics uh, is just one of the applied branches, uh, value branches. Aesthetics, as you said, uh, is another. What is the relation? What is it that human beings are getting out of art? You know, art doesn't serve some utilitarian function, you know, like a fork or a hammer or a, <laughs> some kind of shovel or something. No, art is just there to contemplate. And sometimes I have really intense, sig emotionally significant experiences simply from the act of contemplation. What does that imply about human consciousness? Why is that a need of human consciousness? Why do we react with intense emotion to something that we've just simply contemplated abstractly? And of course, that too invokes the relationship between human consciousness and existence. And because they apply across the board, 
um, uh, it belongs to the broadest field of study, philosophy. Now, objectivism is a philosophy, and it defines philosophy in that way. Not all philosophies do, of course. They, they, they'll approach things in a, in a different way, depending on their answers to different parts of that question. But the great philosophers in history have basically done the same thing. They've given us a, a worldview, a view of what reality is, if or and, and how we know, if we, and to the extent we can know, uh, what we should do, what, what values should guide our lives. And many of them have um, Im implicitly or explicitly a view of politics and art, um, the more comprehensive views. Yeah. So in objectivism, in, we, we don't have time to get into all the, you know, what they all mean, but there's specific terms and principles, for instance, the axiomatic concepts you know, that are at the base of our knowledge, the primacy of existence over consciousness. Uh, in epistemology, we have the uh, conceptual common denominator and measure, measurement of mission as the sort of uh, basis or the, the fundamental part of concept formation. When we go on to X, Rand was an egoist. Human life is the standard of human value. We have reason, purpose, and self-esteem as the fundamental values. And of course, the the primary virtue of rationality in the six derivative virtues. Now, and even in politics, we have capitalism is good, you know, uh, limited government, individual rights, that sort of thing. Now, these are all very broad abstractions. Yeah. First of all, uh, yeah. First of all, objectivism doesn't give out a list of commandments. Thou shalt do this, 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 and this. It, it, it elucidates principles for us to follow. And no philosopher could give you rules for every single situation that you're going to encounter in life. So you, we have to take these abstract principles and apply them to specific situations. But human experience, the complexity of things that are going on is such that we very rarely have all the information or very rarely do all of us have the same information, right? Well, that's so, that's key. People have their own unique context of information. Yes. And in many cases where no one knows the answer to something. The, the the correct answer is I don't know. We don't know. Yes. It's known. Yeah. And I'm not I'm not uh, uh, touting some sort of skepticism here. I'm saying that no, we can well, know what we know within a given context. Right. But when you take a complexity of events taking place, like we have in politics, where you have very very mixed candidates, it's not as if we have John Galt against Adolf Hitler, right? Right. Running for well, office. The way I would put it is this: is is that it's not rare. In fact, I would say objectivism answers most ordinary moral and political questions. <laughs> For 90 plus percent of the standard questions in ethics and politics, the answer is really readily obtained by objectivism. It provides it. Should you um, take easy one? Should, should you steal? Okay. Now, it, it's true that other moral philosophies have said don't steal. It's Ayn Rand's just, justification for that. Or um, be honest. When is it okay to tell a lie and why is it okay? Now, objectivism has some unique things to say about that. But when it comes to normative guidance about thinking, for example, if someone were just a mystic and said, I'm to hell with logic, I'm going to believe it, whatever the evidence and logic says, objectivism would say, no, that's wrong every time, objectively. So there are big questions that objectivism has big, broad, definite answers to. And I could say, if you reject that, you ain't no objectivist. In other words, a mystic cannot be an objectivist. A universal skeptic right. cannot be a, or, or someone who is a um, Kantian deontologist about ethics. He cannot be an objectivist. Uh, uh, objectivism does give, in most cases, uh, the normative guidance that can give you the answers you need when you confront a problem in life and how should I think about this or how should I approach it in terms of my values. On the other hand, the application of these principles, especially in new applications for the first time, I mean, we can't anticipate every single circumstance. And as you point out, individual contexts of knowledge vary. And my context is oftentimes less than omniscient. <laughs> I'm never omniscient. And uh, when I have to predict something, for example, political candidates, it involves a kind of prediction of human events. Now, objectivism, I'll tell you one thing objectivism says, human behavior cannot be predicted with certainty because we believe in free will. Right. So if I'm predicting what Kamala Harris will do or what Donald Trump will do, I have to, from the outset, admit I'm giving you my best estimate of what I think they would likely do, at best. 
because these are human beings and this is the future. Like Yogi Berra, the, the great baseball manager said, predictions are hard, especially about the future. And I would say the predictions are hard, especially about the future of human beings. You know, I can calculate the perihelion of Mars, you know, uh, 500 years from now. I cannot tell you what you're going to eat for lunch tomorrow, Michael. So there's a huge difference between human beings and uh, inanimate matter in terms of their predictability. Um, right. When we talk right. about politics, it is inherent. I mean, we're talking about a vote, who you're voting for. And yeah, within limits, I can tell you that certain candidates are uh, off limits, you know, uh, uh let me put it this way. If it were Adolf Hitler versus Joseph Stalin, obviously we oppose totalitarianism. We favor classical liberal uh, individual freedom or an orientation like that. So anything, the further away you get from that, the more we would object to it. Now, if I'm talking about two very imperfect candidates like uh, Trump and Harris, then what I'm doing is I'm in effect making a judgment call. And the judgment call may be such that I would say they're both such threats. I can't vote at all because I can't really predict what the outcome is going to be because both provide me with unknowns that I'm not comfortable with. On the other hand, let's say, and I've used this example, I think, with you before. Let's say we're talking about a low-level authoritarian thug type uh, who's going to, okay, close a few newspapers and arrest a few political opponents, something I would morally object to, something I would cause a revolution in the government for. But on the other hand, it's author authoritarianism, let's say, of a lesser scale than Adolf Hitler. Well, I think I'd vote for the authoritarianism on a lesser scale rather right. than have Auschwitz open up and World War II happen. Uh, so even in in those, when you're at the most extreme end, let's talk about it this way, two authoritarians, if there is a significant difference, that would be a, a the objectivist thing to do, let me put it that way, would be to vote for the significantly less authoritarian. Right. But you, but if the significance, if the significance is obvious, right? Yeah. Because when I look at, for instance, Donald Trump and Kamala Harris, they're both liars, right? They they both lie. They both uh, say the most ridiculously absurd out of right. connection with right. reality. Right. Um, I could make a case, I think. For why to vote for Trump. I think I can make a case for why to vote for Harris. I can make a case why to vote for nobody. Right. That is the point. Objective. So if so, yeah. So when someone makes a vote, I, I don't get mad at him. Now, no. when somebody touts it as if it's this obvious choice, to, th that I would argue against. Well, but I still wouldn't tell someone you're not an objectivist, but I do well, see that. Yeah. It, let me put it this way there is a right answer here. That is to say, there is a best, most objective, logically best answer. And objectivism is that one of the things objectivism insists on is that that's correct. And but what I have to do is I have to allow for in a context of something dramatically less than certainty, whoever's saying it, look, my decision is going to be dramatically less than certain. So how can I impose on someone else the context of, well, you're not an objectivist if you don't agree with me on this judgment call? Now, there are certain things I can say. It's not who you voted for this time, it's how and why you voted for. And another thing, if you can't see some flaws, at least in Harris or Trump, then I know you're not an objectivist. If you come out, Leonard Peikoff said, for example, oh, Ayn Rand's heir, he came out saying, I'm voting for Trump. And in an interview with me that we did about it, he said, he is not an Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand would not cast him as a hero. I oppose tariffs. I oppose this about him. He's a, he's a bully. He's a, full of bluster. And he, an objectivist has to be critical. Or if someone were to make a case for Harris, and frankly, I have a harder time understanding. This is me in my context, I grant you. I have a harder time understanding the vote for Harris position uh, from an objectivist standpoint, but I could... I could, I could create that argument from an honest context of knowledge. So I have to be able to say to myself, uh, reasonable minds can differ. Right. And if reasonable objectivist minds can even differ, then it's, I think, a big mistake to say this is the objectivist answer. Um, it, as I say, there's unknowns. Now, there is a right answer. In other words, objectively assessed, even with the unknowns of, human, of human, the human future, uh, there is a best answer that most objectively integrates the evidence we do know about them. So in other words, I will respect it when someone says, no, I'm firm on my position. I'm not going to vote for either. I'm firm on my position. I'm going to vote for Trump. I respect that 
as an objectivist. In fact, an objectivist should probably have that kind of level of confidence because there is a right answer. <clears throat> now, on the other hand, while I respect their own confidence in the matter, what I would ask them to do is at least admit in a context like this that reasonable objectivist minds can differ. Yes. Now, I'm reminded of a story about Rabbi Akiba, the, the uh, I think, second century Jewish rabbi, maybe first and second. Yeah. And there was a story that he had 24,000 disciples. And what ended up happening is they all started arguing with each other. And the reason was because Rabbi Akiba said, you know, you should love your brother, some such thing as that, you know, teach your brother the right way. Each person believing they had the right way then went on to try to teach their brother and you ended up with chaos. It, so this is not something that's just uh, intrinsic to objectivism. It can mm -hmm. happen any, but I think but with objectivism, line, you know, the old joke about rabbis, you put three rabbis in a room and you'll end up with five opinions and maybe a couple kosher sandwiches, <laughs> but, uh, but, but five opinions for three rabbis right. is not uncommon. So for, uh, as it's, it's sort of a debate about what the Torah means. And right. so the, last, the better part of the last 2,000 years, Jewish scholars have been sort of engaged. It, Judaism is basically a debating society between yes. experts on what the meaning of the Torah is. Right. So in, in objectivism, it, it, tell me what you think. This is my take or my hypothesis about the situation. As objectivists, we believe in certainty of knowledge within context. We believe in an objective morality. We believe reason is the, you know, the means of finding... Uh, the right conclusions and we believe that it's necessary to judge the behavior of the people that we're dealing with so what can end up happening is as we have this quest for certainty uh, uh, an error that we have to watch out for is not understanding that we may not have the whole context or somebody else might not have the whole context so both sides might be justified within their context of having a certainty that doesn't mean it's a moral failing or a, a moral evil on the part of the other person. And I think that it's a tough sort of uh, line to, to sort of walk because there is the possibility that somebody is being dishonest or, or is being immoral, but that's on us to sort of assess. And I think that with a benevolent, with a benevolent universe perspective we ought to have that benevolence and give people without having a, another reason why not to we ought to give them the benefit of the doubt well you say something very important there there's a huge difference between my as an objectivist i know that there's a right and a wrong answer as i just said and i also know as you point out that moral evaluation is important but Moral evaluation, like any other rational process of identification, can only be done in context, and we have to be able to say, I'm not sure, or sometimes I don't know. Now, objectivism is better than Judaism in one respect. It would in, not, in a lot of respects, Jim, in a lot well, of respects. <laughs> well, this respect that we were just talking about, it would not admit of five different answers with three different rabbis because it's that vague. Because guess what? The foundations of Judaism are in mysticism, and right. that makes it inherently vague and ambiguous. Moreover, there's clear guidance. I mean, Jewish scholars will tell you, most Jewish scholars, for example, will tell you there is certain clear guidance, kosher diet, da, 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 you know, <laughs> keeping the Sabbath in a certain way, et cetera. But uh, uh, the reasons for it are going to be different, and therefore the applications are going to be different, and therefore you can have an endless debate on it. Objectivism to, tells you the method that we you have to use. If someone says, no, I'm not going to use logic, I'm not going to base it on observation, or they're not an objectivist. If someone says, well, no, I, life isn't my standard. I can, I can act in contradiction to the needs of human life, left and right. You're not an objectivist. If you say, uh, I want to be dishonest, I can, I can lie to, to, in, in the attempt to gain a value. I can tell you, you're not an objectivist. If you say, I can initiate physical force against someone else properly, you're not an objectivist. Um, <laughs> there are certain things where I can say with clarity and precision, there can be no debate about. I mean, a philosophy is useful because it is a technology that will help me answer my questions and get by in life. On the other hand, people have individual contexts, their own discovery arcs, 
we all, I mean, my God, if you were to judge me based on what I knew when I was a teenager or in my 20s and how I had that understanding in my head, I look back on it with horror now. And I, and you know, age helps <laughs> because when you look back, you know, the funny thing is, is that I was completely omniscient too. I knew yeah. everything and boy, did I know it with certainty. And I realized as the years went by um, how much I don't know and how uncertain about certain things I thought I was certain of that I was. That's not a, to impugn human knowledge, and nor is it to impugn any of the principles of objectivism or my certainty about them. But what it does tell me is that I had a learning curve, and I better the hell respect other people's learning curves. So even when I disagree with them, I can't morally judge them without really understanding their context. Now, even that has certain limits. If someone were to say to me today, oh yeah, I am a Nazi, and I am going to advocate publicly for Nazism. I'm sorry, that is not a moral position to take. I judge people based on their beliefs sometimes. You can judge people just based on their beliefs because thinking is an act of volition. All volitional acts are normative acts, whether a person's evading, whether a person's actively trying. But if a person is actively trying to apply reason, sincerely, I'm going to cut them all the slack in the world. If some little kid doesn't know the history of the Holocaust and says, hey, I'm a Nazi, I will sit them down and explain to them the history of Adolf Hitler and the Holocaust and World War II and get them cleared up on the matter so that it, they can see uh, with clarity why it, that is an unacceptable position for an informed person to take. <clears throat> when it comes to some other complex matters, we were talking about politics, like who to vote for. Well, you're not an objectivist if you don't vote for and let me put it this way, uh, Leonard Peikoff, Ayn Rand's heir, I regard him as the world's leading authority on objectivism. If you didn't vote for Trump, I still think you could be an objectivist, even within the meaning of Leonard Peikoff. I, I don't know what Leonard would say about it. Leonard might disagree with me about this. He might think that, that this case, and you know, you might have a case. I'm like, let, me go, let me make an even broader point. When people disagree, at least one of the person persons involved, that something's gone wrong in their cognitive process. I can say that with clarity and confidence. Now, what do we mean gone wrong? Now, both of us might be wrong. Something may have gone wrong in both of our cognitive processes, but at least one of, at least one of us is, has got a mistake. Uh, but now, it could be an innocent error of knowledge. It could simply be like the child, a total ignorance and a lack of knowledge. Oh, it could be that they have a certain perspective on things that really struck them uh, and they're in that context, in that moment. And there were many times in life where someone is so buried into a certain project, it's almost unfair to ask them an outside question about some other context. Well, leave me alone. And if they spurt out something, ah, well, this, and it turns out to be wrong, I cut them slack. Well, you were focused on that right now, and that wasn't your, your main interest. You just threw that off. You're right, Jim. Okay, I should have thought that more, and I should have given you that qualification. Okay, they're still sincere. They're still honest. But every mistake that we make implies that we either had an epistemological mistake, we lacked context, or indeed we may have even made a moral, it may be in, well involve a moral failure, ev evasion. Evasion uh, is the source of a great deal of the errors and mistakes that people make. In the 21st century, if a serious intellectual person who studied philosophy says, I believe in God, I admit to you, Michael, I got some serious questions about their grip on logic and their understanding of the philosophical developments of the last few centuries. Honestly, I would have serious doubts about that person's honesty. Honesty. If they were well-informed, well-informed. Ayn Rand says something very powerful in Atlas Shrugged. There is no honest revolt against reason. If someone were to say, at some point, in some form, and there's various ways, there's a thousand different ways, one can overtly deny reason, and they do it. Well, you know, uh, and you can, you, the projection of it is infinite on this, but they will give you, they'll give you some mysticism, and it's typically some form of mysticism or subjectivism, skepticism, that they're offering you to undermine your knowledge, your confidence in that, uh, without giving a positive, rational argument themselves. Or if they just simply flout the need to give evidence, they just assert the arbitrary. Well, that's what I feel. It's based on my feelings. Rank mysticism like that. Um, 
there's a moral failure there. If I say I'm not going by reason, I know that's how people know, but I'm rejecting reason, the conditions of reason. Well, there's no discussing anything with them at that point. And they're not engaged in a cognitive process at all. And I can judge, I will judge them based on that, just like that. Now, if a person is sincerely trying to find the answer, and I disagree with their conclusion, and if they're deploying the best philosophical principles at their disposal within their context, I will say that they're a good person, but they're innocently mistaken. There can be innocent mistakes. And before we go around morally judging people, you are a hater of humanity, or you're a fake objectivist. I, 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 I heard someone, a friend of mine on online uh, recently in the wake of the election, you're a fake objectivist if you don't vote my way. That's harsh because what you're saying about everyone, despite their context, whatever their con, see, whether you agree with his position on that this is the, uh, quote, best objectivist answer to the question or not by saying all the people who disagree with me on this point where people can reasonably disagree are fake objectivists, you're making a sweeping moral condemnation of people, ignoring their individual contexts. That is the fake objectivism. Now, Jim, I got to tell you, I find it astounding because I'm, you mentioned that you were omniscient uh, in your younger years. Yes. And, and it's, what, it's, what are yes. the chances that two guys like us, both omniscient in our, in our early years, would run into each other in these later times? It's quite astonishing, isn't it? The two yeah, omniscient yeah. people decades yeah. ago who yeah. are so omniscient now. <laughs> yeah, yeah but it's, it's, it, it's quite startling. Oh, I now, was invisible and I was, I was immortal and I was omniscient. And now, that's, sometimes what I think it is to be a young man. <laughs> no, you and I had a debate once, and it's one of the debates where you got the best of me, and because you were right. So, <laughs> <laughs> see, uh, it's such an important thing to do. Sometimes you're right when we have an argument. Sometimes I'm right. Yeah, and it's it's not a big deal. <laughs> you get it into your head. The honest person changes their view. Yeah, that's it. The honest but, person <laughs> will modify their view based on. Oh yeah, I screwed up. Yeah, I was wrong about that. Yeah. I better change. I better have that affect the rest of my thinking and change the way I approach it. Yeah, see, now I thought <laughs> for quite a long time that within the broader libertarian, I'll call it world, small L, and by that I just mean people that are advocating for capitalism and individual rights. Uh, you know, I don't want to get into a big thing with anybody watching. I'm no libertarian. Fine. But I'm just talking about the broader movement in defense of limited government, the American system, you know, the American history, whatever. There's a lot of these schisms, and I thought there's no way we're ever going to be able to get capitalism established when everybody who advocates it argues and ends up in these schisms. But you actually pointed out to me, no, I was, I had it exactly wrong. The opposite is, is the truth. And I thought, well, this guy's crazy. But then you made your argument, and I said, well, well this guy's right. So all of a sudden, you became reasonable. But at, you know, as is the, you know, par for the course, I didn't then say to myself, wow, I must have been crazy to have that other view. Because when I'm the one mistaken, it's all perfectly understand. <laughs> <laughs> well, cut yourself some slack. You know, I've learned, I've beaten myself up for mistakes I've made before. And sometimes, you know, it's Leonard Peikoff and objectivism, specifically Leonard Peikoff, or objectivism in general, that gives me the comfort that, wait, you had a context. You came at it that way. That's the way you were raised. You could, it's almost, I mean, if we take, give an easy example, put you in a time machine back a thousand years. Now I'm going to have a very different attitude about intellectuals who believe in God. Right. <laughs> okay. I'm going to have a radically, or a slave owner 300 years ago or 200 years ago. I'm going to have a different attitude to, the, to that person. Now, after John Locke and Montesquieu start making really good philosophical arguments against slavery, now I'm going to start more and more and more judging people. And as the con con uh, cultural context exposes more people to that idea than even slave owners like George Washington or Thomas Jefferson, could realize this is a bad thing. I'm doing a bad thing. Now, can I judge those to the extent, to the extent that they realized it was a bad thing and they didn't fight it? Yeah. But was the context a world of slavery? Yeah, it's still different than, the say, the century that would follow or the century that would follow after that. So context is critical to our moral evaluation, it seems to me. I'm not going to yeah. totally judge a caveman for lack of a better term you know someone with the stone age uh, uh, the same way i'm going to judge uh someone in the 21st century who has a normal education 
Does that make sense? It, it, well, it does. And it especially makes sense to me because it covers a point that I've been trying to make to people in my life for maybe, I don't know, 20 years now. And given my own personal context, the fact that I ended up in prison, I was raised by drug addicts and criminals and I ended up in prison. And I'll talk to people and I'll say, you have to understand my my context. And I'll to, they'll say, why did you become a criminal? And I'll give them, you know, listen, I, I idolized my father who was a criminal. And I'll say, you have, but these are reasons. They're not excuses, right? So you, you, you take the context. It's not to excuse my behavior in any way, shape, or form. I was still wrong. I was still immoral. But you can't just pretend that I just like sprang out of the womb a, a, a hardened criminal because that's not true either. So you can at the same time judge me and ought to, but judge me accurately that, with, 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 with the full context of information behind you. Well, see, that's the whole thing. I was a prosecutor for almost 18 years. And so I've read thousands upon thousands of psychiatric forensic psych reports from defendants pending sentencing um, or uh, people claiming some mental defense in, in trial. So I've read a bunch of forensic psych reports and I have made certain generalizations about people's childhoods and contexts based on your childhood and context. You are absolutely heroic, my brother, to have overcome your Thank context. You. I have Thank you, Jim. people who overcome difficult contexts, and the more difficult the context, the more heroic it is. But guess what, people? You are the poster child. <laughs> In fact, you, uh, Leonard Peikoff himself the other night when I was telling your story, reminding him again of your story, Mr. Leibowitz, he was saying what an astonishing man that must be. Because really, he's he, he is the proof of free will, no matter how how bad the background is. See, ordinarily, even objectivist would say someone with your background has not got much of a chance of you know something bad. It's not going to be good for your character or psychological development. It's just not going to be. Now, I've seen people who come from very privileged backgrounds turn into just completely rotten, immoral people. Sure. And they didn't have the violence and the threats and the, you know, the dad you did, the mom you did. And so and nor the childhood exposed to such fear and violence and isolation that you did. Now, uh, on either end of the spectrum, though, we each have a moral responsibility to develop our own character. We each have. That's one of the principles of objectivism, by the way. Human right. beings being volitional. That being beings of volitional consciousness, they're, every one of us, our own most important task in life is the development of our own moral character. That you consciously discovered that and consciously built a character well, from the context you had, nothing could be more heroic, my brother. Thank you so much. And you just gave me a great clip because I post clips from my episodes. Jim Valiant talking to Leonard Peikoff about me and Leonard Peikoff's response. That That's a clip. <laughs> but uh, but it, it's interesting. I mean, just Friday, Friday night, he said. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting given some of my recent experience. And this takes us a little bit of field from the discussion about objectivism. But I, I posted a clip where I, I was interviewed by a psychologist on my show. I let her interview me. And I told her a story about how idolizing my father, I used to try to be like him. He was violent. So I, you know, I was violent. Of my my own volition, but nonetheless, that was you know my mindset. Later on in life, when I was incarcerated, my mother had committed suicide, and her husband, uh, you know, who I didn't like, I couldn't stand him, and my father couldn't stand him either. My tells me on the phone, "I'm going to go run this guy over with a car," and I'm like, "What are you doing? You know, you're in your fifties. This is ridiculous." And he tells me, "You're this is not my son talking to me. That you know, he's, and I and I mentioned in this clip." When I was young, that would have gotten to me. But as an adult, I realize how ridiculous it is. So now I look on TikTok and there's people commenting, oh, no way. I I'm with your father on that one. I, you, I can let that go like you're letting it go. And I asked one of them, I said, let me ask you a question. I said, how much time have you served as a result of listening to people like my father? Because I served 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sir, right. sir, 20 some years in prison and you'll get right. a different attitude. So he yeah. comes back and he says, oh, he said, well, if you're actually talking about killing the guy, he said, I'm just thinking people are just talking. And my response was, nope. And that's the thing is you're it, you're making comments uh, on something without grasping the key thing there, context. Maybe in your life, people run around making comments like that and it means nothing. 
in my life over in the car sometimes i get so mad i want to punch someone in the face and i know that's wrong it may be an immediate anger reaction and being a male filled with testosterone i want to act out on the anger but look that's what it is to be a human being is to feel angry and my feeling that i want to punch someone who's done something unjust doesn't make it okay unless he unless i really am defending myself or someone else from his physical force i can't use physical force against him full stop if he's committed some crime against my mom then i will call the police and i will say let me give you the evidence let's see if we can put a case together so we can prosecute this guy under law if he's committed a crime against my mom but i'm not going to be a vigilante i'm not going to be a martyr i'm not going to be a, but i will use force to defend myself or my wife if some asshole comes up and starts threatening us absolutely i will you know and jim you know this for me is what objectivism really is and I fall into it as much, if not more than anybody and get into all kinds of political stuff. But politics is by no means the greatest part of objectivism. For me, the greatest part of objectivism is teaching me to think rationally, teaching me a moral code, how I'm supposed to, that those are the biggest things. Politics is, it's, I'm not not trying to say it's not important. No, it's obviously. but, But, but. In juxtaposition with what it means to be a being of self-made soul, it's secondary. I am, I, I am not primarily an advocate of capitalism, but right. of egoism. And I'm not primarily an advocate of egoism, but of reason. You yes. can reason all the rest follows. Yes, objectivism most importantly and above all else. And Ayn Rand, it, you know, if if reason had... Like, this, It's so integrated in my mind, this is an impossible hatched example. But let's say that her reason and her basic values had led her to be a socialist. Ayn Rand would have been a socialist. Her primary values were being rational, adhering to reality, and having life as the standard. And those are really the the bigger issue for her. Understand those, and believe me, the rest will follow. Now, in her own context, during her own teen years, there was this thing going on called the Russian Revolution, and then the Soviet takeover. So from a very early age, politics impressed her, but the politics of it impressed her. She wasn't a religious conservative, say, in Russia, like the people who opposed the communists were, by and large. <clears throat> Nor was she an advocate of the czars in any way. She wanted a completely, she didn't even want a constitutional monarch, you know, and it was suggested under Kerensky. No, no, she wanted a real, that's why Kerensky was really a hero. She was a Republican. <laughs> but the point is, even that level of politics, which she could feel, she hadn't yet worked out or even her politics, but she could feel in a, in a real way, wait a minute, these communists are dry, creating a slave society. And she could see that, stripping me of my ambition, my hope, and she could feel that individually. So for her, it was, you know, living through the Soviet uh, experience that was helping to inform her view of politics. But you know something much more important to her, much more fundamental, as you point out, is her approach to uh, knowledge and to value, basic value questions. She believed those were the reasons why communism was so evil or Nazism and why America was so great. And while these other compromises were just compromises, um, that's what informed her, her, uh, her understanding of reason and values, which is far more important in my view. And you're not an objectivist if you don't accept her view about the initiation of force and what the role of government is. This anarcho-capitalist guy, I, Ayn Rand argued from her objectivist principles why anarchism was wrong, and she made a pretty darn good case. So I think anarchism is outside of objectivism. Right. Um, now, that doesn't mean if somebody makes an argument for anarchy, well, Ayn Rand says it's wrong. <laughs> so it's wrong. That would be an argument from authority. Yeah. But to you say it, it, yeah. it's not objectivism because objectivism is Ayn Rand's philosophy. No. It, no. it, it, it can't be a part of it. All right. So, Jim. We now have our answer. For So for anybody out there who's wondering what is an objectivist, here's the answer. You're going to ask Jim Valiant, and Jim Valiant is going to make the decision, and he's going to give it. And... <laughs> the oracle, Jim Valiant, should be <laughs> one in charge of uh, deciding these things. Uh, you know, let her peek off for so long after Ayn Rand's death. You know, Ayn Rand made it in his air. He said, I'm not a pope, and it's not a church. <laughs> You know, but he'll make and he'll make jokes. He'll make jokes like, well, if I were a pope, I'd excommunicate that guy who's an <laughs> objectivist. 
<laughs> and even he knows the person is still, quote, an objectivist. Does that make sense? Of course it does. Of so that we does. know that's not the way we we approach that. Um, uh, an objective, now, objectivism is one thing. An objectivist, you could be saying a couple of different things. In ones like you could about anything. For example, if I were to say uh, St. Francis of Assisi was a Christian, what am I saying about St. Francis? I'm saying a bunch of things all at once. He be he believes, that could be one context, he actually sincerely believes in the doctrines of Christianity. Two, he advocates, he promotes, publicly suggests, normatively advises to be a Christian. And three, he consistently acts on his best understanding of Christianity. Now, each of those same things you could say, you know, Christianity is obviously mysticism and the very opposite of objectivism in every fundamental way. <laughs> so don't be confused about that. Uh, and our view of what a hero is, is Howard Rourke, not Francis of Assisi, okay? So, and that's what's really interesting about Ayn Rand too. She not only gave us moral principles, she gave us novels with characters so that we could see living concretely in reality an objectivist, in effect, acting in reality, having love affairs, getting married and divorced, struggling in his career, dealing with career issues and his integrity. Ayn Rand is going to show you that in action so that you have a view of what in concrete terms. And you even have the answers in most cases. You know, it's just as people say, what would Jesus do? See, there's a story behind Christianity, a narrative tale so there are narrative tales that Ayn Rand gives us. So similarly, I could say, what would Howard Rourke do? And without even going through all the motions of objectivist principles, you can almost know automatically what Howard Rourke would do under most given circumstances. That is a complete moral worldview. So what is an objectivist? An objectivist could be someone who believes it, yeah, sincerely and honestly. Two, someone who advocates it, someone who actually promotes it. True, and are they advocating the principles, the philosophical principles articulated by Ayn Rand? You say you had differences with Ayn Rand. I have differences with Ayn Rand. I like Beethoven. <laughs> she didn't like Beethoven. Uh, her favorite color was this uh, blue-green, a kind of turquoise color. I like turquoise. It's not my favorite color, okay? <laughs> Do those things make you an objectivist or not an objectivist? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. My agreement with the basic principles of the philosophical principles that Ayn Rand agreed with, that makes you an objectivist or not. So one, do you agree with the philosophical principles of Ayn Rand? Do you advocate the philosophical principles of Ayn Rand? And finally, do you live up to those as you best understand them? Because after all, you could either be a liar or a hypocrite. Someone could say they believe in objectivism, be insincere about it, and the proof is sort of in the tasting of the pudding, isn't it? The the, uh, the Absolutely, it is. If someone were to be dishonest, and I know he's being dishonest, if someone were to violate someone else's rights, if someone were to overtly reject logic and reason as a means of knowing, I'm done. You ain't no objectivist. Whatever sounds come out of your mouth, in reality, you are, because objectivism, well, it builds it in, right on in with the virtue of integrity. It says hypocrisy, bad. you got to be totally consistent with your principles. And if you're not being consistent with your principles, just right there, you can't be an objectivist. And if they are aware of an inconsistency in their principles, or if I point it out and they don't care, then I can tell you right there, whatever they call themselves, they're not an objectivist. So when someone says, self-identifies, I'm an objectivist, I've gotten to the point over the last 40 plus years where it's basically noise to me. It's just white noise. And I, it doesn't move the dial, the needle one little bit. It's not moved when they say, I'm an objectivist. <laughs> I have to really listen to them talk and listen to them tell me about themselves. How do you act? How do you live? What, what are your operative values? And when I can get a sense of their operative values, then I can say they both sincerely believe it and they put it into practice. That is a real objectivist. Now, if someone were to just make an argument, and I don't know anything about their personal context, and that argument is consistent with objectivism, I would say that they are an objectivist in that regard, in that they are advocating and promoting what I regard as objectivism. I would still need to know that author's actual behavior to know if he was some kind of liar or hypocrite, sure. wouldn't I? So if I'm morally evaluating someone or even identifying them, 
in, in a very significant sense, the their behavior is an important way of saying, are they an objectivist in practice? You say, are they an objectivist in their stated beliefs? That's one definition of what an objectivist is. Are they an objectivist in their conduct? And as I say, within certain limits, uh, I mean, there are things that are absolutely not objectivist, but there are all kinds of options within objectivism. We not only recognize that people have different contexts of knowledge, we recognize that there are personal values. I, I was a lawyer for 18 years. Some people would have a just a hell, they wouldn't want to be a lawyer. They wouldn't want to deal with criminals and people like what you were. And said, I don't want criminal law. I don't want to look at gory crime scene pictures, things like that. And so, or I wouldn't want to be a surgeon, a doctor, a, phys a physician. There's no way I would work in a hospital. Their achie greatest achievements of man's mind, modern hospitals, but I hate the places. Okay. <laughs> and I would have been a lousy doctor. So, what's objective for me personally? See, it's not even that's not subjective. What's objective for me personally is not going to be objective in every case for you personally. Right. So I have to make account allowance for individual options that are within the range. Objectivism says be productive, be honest. And so being a doctor or a lawyer, you can be an honest and productive doctor or lawyer, uh, but within the range of pro productiveness and honesty, both doctor and lawyer are, but being a thief, being an armed robber, no, that's not productiveness. That's not honesty. It's certainly not justice or respecting people's rights. So um, let me put it this way. Um, there's different senses in which a person, uh, I define a person as an objectivist. Um, I've seen your conduct, sir. And so based on the integrity and the honesty and the sincerity with which you try to understand and apply, I mean, talk about an instance of someone I can see applying sincerely applying it to their lives. That's why I, in our earlier conversation, I told you, Michael, don't listen to these other people. You are sincerely applying to your real life, your best understanding of objectivism. That makes you more of an objectivist than a lot of people who spout ideas and quote Ayn Rand and who don't live up to it. But in a sense, anyone who advocates or articulates or sincerely believes in objectivism in that sense is an objectivist. Now, you could say, uh, um, you know, a lot of people will say, uh, it's a logical fallacy. He, he does something unchristian or what we don't like, and so we call it unchristian, therefore he's not a Christian. I think that's a cheesy argument. But if, on the other hand, someone is sincerely applying uh, Christianity, they take an oath of celibacy or poverty, things advocated in the New Testament by Jesus and St. Paul, then I would say they're they have integrity. Sure. They're being consistent with Christianity with a degree of integrity, as anti-life, as vows of celibacy and poverty are, in my view. Still, they're trying to, they're do they're sincerely trying to live up to their best understanding of Christianity. That makes them um, uh, a Christian uh with integrity. Does that make sense? It does. And I just gotta tell you before we go that I am so relieved that the two of us do not have to get together in turquoise wallpapered rooms. <laughs> Buy, buy ourselves a few cats and blast Rachmaninoff all night. One day I will get you to like Rachmaninoff. <laughs> it is required of all objectivists to love Rachmaninoff. No, it is not. But uh, I do love Rachmaninoff, and I will keep persisting. But you know something? If you never love Rachmaninoff, you're still an objectivist. <laughs> all right, Jim. So where can the people find you? I'm active on social media, especially Facebook, uh, where I help manage the uh, Ayn Rand and John Gall line and Leonard Peikoff study and appreciation pages. I answer questions there almost every day. And people can find me here on a regular basis. Seems like every other week I'm here on your show. So come catch me here on The Rational Egoist, one of the best podcasts you'll ever work. What do you mean one of the best? The well, best. The best. Well, you see, I appear on more than one podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so is that the definition of a great podcast? It's, Jim it's, Science it's on good, the podcast. It's a good podcast. operative definition of the best. The best. The omniscient. Podcast. The omniscient Jim Valiant. The omniscient Jim Valiant. <laughs> so, I think we can look at it that way. The <laughs> best podcasts in the world, by definition, are the ones that have me on. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, for now, this is the Rational Egoist signing out. Till next time. <laughs>